Iran, there's China. There's also the, the, the a major constraint the Russians never cease to point out is that the U.S. But can't get its budget act together, and therefore mm -hmm. constrains what you know. We constrains the amount of money we're, we're willing to spend on these initiatives. So, um, and there's a you know, it'd be great to bail out the Ukrainian economy with the Marshall Effect plan, but you know, the U.S. is going to pay for that, mm -hmm. and so on down the line. Um, so it's it's not clear to me how important Russia will be in the U.S. side of the election, and certainly, the, but certainly in the Russia side, uh, there's no besides yet there's no domestic political imperative on Putin's part to try and change. So even if the Gallup can come out with a poll showing that Russia's overall <coughs> opinion in the world is terrible and it's falling fast, as long as his opinion is solid at home, he's, I'm not, I'm, 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 I know what he's, which polls he's going to pay most attention to. Yeah, I just want to add that. I mean, Rich is absolutely right. I mean, I don't think any of us here think that Russia's going to do a major campaign issue <coughs> beyond uh, rhetorics. It'll just simply be that the, the candidates won't want to take on the position, which has been very restrained on the part of the Obama administration. But if we look at um, uh, every um, administration that's come in, the rhetoric and the reality have never really matched up because of the need to actually um, take uh, steps on concrete uh, concrete issues, and Richard's right on that. But I think that's kind of one of the points that you bring out in uh, your report, that the polling in the United States, even if Russia may poll negatively, you know, what was it in one of the figures you had? It was sort of eighteen percent of Americans sort of see, you know, kind of the, uh, Russia as kind of negative in a, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a tight group with China and Iran. Eighteen percent isn't a particularly, you know, high figure. It means the majority of people don't really think about this at all. I mean, very different from at least the emotional reaction that you get in uh, some of uh, some of the Russian polling. Um, <clears throat> but no, of course, that's for different reasons. But Russia is never traditionally, or foreign policy is not traditionally big campaign issue here, whereas just you said and you're pointing out, it's very popular to play with this in a Russian uh, a Russian perspective. So we shouldn't get carried away about you know how people really think about things here. Maybe that's the problem. We yeah. don't think enough. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, CDI actually pressed me to look at the polling data, what I would normally, but they you know they wanted us to do the US polling. And no yeah. Russia yeah. oh, Russia's And it's interesting is that it's extremely volatile to both countries. Right. So you know whereas US views of for example Iran or some other thing that's consistently negative. Russia, it just it goes all over the map. So a couple of years ago, it was really high, um, and and you know it was, it was down during Georgia, and then we found it. Now it's back down again. But there's there doesn't seem to be a strong, enduring anti-Russia sentiment among the American people. Yep. And in Russia, you get the same volatility, and it seems to reflect you know <coughs> top-down elite messaging um, how much they want to emphasize. So it means it can change. And so I don't consider the opinion to be a major constraint uh, in, 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 in either place. It can't change. Um, so. But I will not let you avoid this question about Crimea. Is for the United States the question is closed? What do you mean by closed? Well, Crimea is in Russia. No. Nobody talks about that? No, people will talk about it. They'll talk about it in Europe as well, just to be very clear about that. I, I mean, yeah. okay, we can talk about that. But no, it, 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 is, it isn't going to be closed, because it is, it is um, breaking um, a taboo. I was more addressing, he's saying, you know, beyond, I, I took it more about what are the common interests beyond Ukraine and Crimea. Crimea and Ukraine, these issues are not going to go away. What does it mean? Uh, is it an obstacle to build relations? <coughs> it's an obstacle to build the kind of close relationship that really this report is um, aiming towards, absolutely. Because right now, Crimea um, is not going to be, you know, look, the Baltic states were parked during the Cold War in, you know, kind of a, you know, the, the dotted lines on Mars during the Cold War, well, there wasn't much of a relationship to talk about. Crimea has now happened, just as the war with Georgia happened, at the end of, you know, kind of a whole period of 30 years in which, you know, most people in the United States and, and very much the majority of people in Europe were bought into the idea that there was a convergence with Russia. That Russia was on a path basically to be integrated in the same, you know, larger systems, the same kind of world order. Now that's where obviously there was a major miscalculation because there was a, you know, not enough paying attention to this different frame and this different narrative. The Europeans, in particular, feel very betrayed. And when I talk about the Europeans, of course, I'm not mentioning thinking about the Spaniards or you know some others in the South who are really paying much less attention. But any of the Europeans in the you know kind of the northern part of Europe who have had close relationships with Russia traditionally feel betrayed by this. And I can't stress that enough. I mean, and this is not that's not just some people in the United States are taking this very personally because this was kind of part of 
you know, the whole Europe free whole and um, peace uh, mantra slogans of successive administrations from Bush all the way, you know, kind of Bush one to Clinton to, uh, to Obama. And the people who were part of the architects of that feel very aggrieved. I don't think the rest of the Russian, uh, the U.S. population really you know, has particularly much of a judgment on that. But in Europe, that's actually um, much more fundamental. Now, all the accusations about violations of post-World War II borders are, are against the United States, Kosovo and everything else, even in Europe. When was the last time since World War II that a European country violated the territorial integrity of the country? Anybody think of one? Probably the United Kingdom. <laughs> Turkey. Armenia. Uh, part of the European Union. Armenia. Part of the European Armenia. Union. Armenia. 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 Lots of U.S. interventions that we can think about, and you know, kind of past precedents. But this is not resonating in Europe, and I sometimes think this is why I keep harping about this: that we're having our own little internal U.S.-Russia debate here. That's not factoring in agency on the part of Europeans, who are not some unwashed mass. There are people in the European Union who feel just as strongly as the United States does. Maybe not all Greeks and Spaniards, and but more Italians than you might think. Spent a lot of time in Italy. And Renzi and others are much more uh, complex on their views than uh, might be thought, you know, if you think back to dear old Mr. Berlusconi and in bed with Putin, literally. So, I mean, I think we have to be very careful that when we make all of uh, these judgments about this, this is not going to be, unfortunately, back to what we had before. Whatever we're talking about going beyond Ukraine is something different. There's something new, and it can be much more for the United States limited. And I think for the Europeans, it's going to be much more limited than it would be before. And I think that's a tragedy. I really do think it's a tragedy. But it's not going to be easy to get beyond this, even if Crimea is you know, dotted on everybody's maps uh, in the future. I hate to, 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 to make this point, but I think it's necessary that, unfortunately, that may be true in Europe. It's not true anywhere else. So for Asian people, where we're both in, in the United States and in, in Russia considered to be a more important continent in the future, um, they, you know, they, they reluctantly, like in the case of Japan, gone along with the sanctions over, you know, with, uh, over the Ukraine. In some cases, a lot of countries, like brought in China and India, just have not even bothered to do that. Um, they are quite, they're not going to make uh, Crimea or Ukraine much of an issue. They're just, I mean, and that's, and that's so... They're, they're not going to go along with the sanctions, that's absolutely true, but the trust in Russia and the judgment of Russia has been very much uh, lowered as a result of this. I'm not saying well, I know this for a fact for China, but I do from the fact of Turkey, where, where the annexation of Crimea has been very unpopular. I've just met with the Turkish embassy yesterday, and this very point came up. Remember, there are an awful lot of Crimean Tartars, I think, in Turkey. And the Crimean Tartars were Turks. They weren't Tartars as in Volga Tartars in any case. And every, pretty much, you know, you can look in the Turkish hierarchy right now, there's not people with Turkish, uh, with Crimean Tartar ancestry. The Indians and uh, Modi were furious when um, Putin showed up with um, Aksyonov in tow, and they have their own territorial disputes uh, with uh, China. The Chinese were not exactly thrilled by the re-annexation you know, of, uh, or the annexation of Crimea either because of their own you know, territorial concerns. Remember, they gave the um, Central Asians plenty of cover and the Belarusians um, at the SCO uh, conference to not recognize Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, which the Russians were pressuring them to do. And the Japanese are always hoping for the Kurils to be returned. And they think it's highly unlikely now that uh, Russia has annexed Crimea because of you know, the historical uh, parallels uh, there. Because frankly, Russia had the right under wartime provisions to annex the Kuril Islands. That's in the British archives. I did work on this years ago. The United States was stoking the Kuril Islands uh, dispute for its own political purpose for a long time. The Russians know that, the Japanese know that, and others know that. So the, the Japanese were hoping, you know, for a different, they were hoping to have a big visit by Putin this year. They didn't want to go on the sanctions, they didn't want to ruin the prospect of having some other kind of political relationship, especially as they're worried about China. But what I'm, going to, what I'm saying about this is that Russia's standing has been diminished because of this, not elevated. It might have been elevated in the post-Soviet space, as you know, kind of a lot of, um, you know, kind of nostalgia in some respects for the, you know, the old Soviet Union. But outside of Russia, it hasn't been particularly seen as Russia's finest moment, even though people can understand why it was done. Okay. 
Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I, my name is Mikhail Mamedev. I'm an adjunct professor at Tokyo Center. Thank you so much. Mikhail Mamedev, I'm an adjunct professor at Georgetown and George Mason. Yeah, I have a little bit different question. Well, you mentioned actually Georgia, Russia, Georgia war. And I have kind of doubt, uh, double question. And uh, well, during the whole Cold War, world was kind of uh, between real war and Cold War. And today, when archives are open, a uh, historian probably can see that the Soviet Union never had real intention to start war with the West. And also, since you mentioned 2008 war, we remember now, we know now that today's government of Georgia did not give up its pro-Western stand, but at the same time, Mikhail Saakashvili is wanted today, and Georgian dream uh, started lawsuit against him, and Mikhail Saakashvili is hiding hiding actually in Ukraine, well, he tried to find, he tried to, he tried to stay in the United States, it did not work out, so now he's in Ukraine. My question is, first of all, don't you think that today's, like, perception of Russia as really aggressive power is sort of kind of continuation of Western images, maybe Western prejudices against Russia that comes uh, from the time of Cold War? And second, don't you think that maybe in four years, Mr. Poroshenko would be wanted by a new Ukrainian government and maybe another party will win in Ukraine. Maybe it will be called Ukrainian Dream and they will start lawsuit against Mikhail Poroshenko and they will bring charges against him for starting war in Ukraine or something like that. Thank you. And thank you for the great presentation. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, Igor Danchenko, I'm an analyst here in Washington. Um, well. Um, well, you know, Crimea is not uh, uh, in the European Union or in Turkey, and uh, you know th there are all kinds of you know, there are all kinds of arguments we could make about this, right? Bringing Turkey, um, Armenia, etc. Um, uh, a common, uh, a rather common argument that I sometimes hear uh, in uh, uh, in Russia is that, um, especially among uh, uh, specialists in federalism and former Soviet Union uh, more broadly, is that. Uh, Somehow it seems that, uh, well, you know, Europe has its principles, uh, post-World War II borders are indivisible, etc. But uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, it seems like we're protecting borders within the Russian Federation, that is, um, administrative borders and uh, the former Soviet, Soviet borders, uh, as borders drawn by Joseph Stalin personally. You know, you know, in, in the 40s and 50s. So is is that really? Uh, you know, and there is often this argument: like, Do we really need to stick to these very borders drawn by Stalin for, you know, at a very different time for very different political uh, reasons? Simply because you know there is, uh, you know, there, there, the the issue between, I don't know, uh, Netherlands and its neighbors. You know, it, 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 there's not, no major issue there, for example. And then secondly, you mentioned differences in democracy and perception uh, amongst people. Uh, as sort of follow up on my previous commentary, uh, what's, what's the perception of uh, state sovereignty in Russia, the United States, and the European Union? I mean, obviously there are differences there. I would like to hear your comments on how these differences could be reconciled, I mean, because obviously uh, some, some sort of common ground needs to be found. Thank you. Okay, Steve? Yes, Stephen Blank, American Chronicle. Yeah. Um, both of you have, each in your own way, uh, pointed out that the Obama administration seems to be uh, bel uh, believing that uh, there's nothing we can really seriously accomplish at a strategic level for, for the duration of its term in office. And uh, I think that you've also implied that ultimately they, were, they don't really take Russia that seriously as a problem. Uh, perhaps the Middle East means more, and that uh, they've done nothing to reverse this kind of bravado that we see coming out of Moscow, that we can get away, that the Americans are weak and can't do anything. Would you suggest that it's desirable, one, for the United States to do something to affect Russian thinking in a non-provocative way? Because in Europe, as Fiona has pointed out, we already see Poland and the Baltic states formally announcing they're going to ask NATO for permanent deployment of troops at the next NATO summit next year, which would be a major uh, provocation in what, uh, from what, to use Russia's word, to Russia. 
So don't you believe that it's necessary on our part to do something to get the Russians to realize that we mean business and that th this attitude of bravado is only going to lead them into serious miscalculations that are going to have disastrous effects on Russia? And I'm not talking about dropping a nuclear weapon or something, but a political move to make it clear that uh, we are serious and that uh, this bravado does not benefit either Russia or uh, its uh, interests. Okay. What's the start? <coughs> um, <laughs> which is delegating the, yeah, this democratic uh, centralism, <laughs> uh, which is delegated the first uh, <coughs> to uh, to me. Um, Mikhail, I think that's a, I mean, it's a very good point about the um, Russia Georgia war and you know the, the various prejudices. Look, I think it's, it's it's very clear that you know I think from everything that we've discussed uh, here that. You know, Russia hasn't been, you know, a major public topic of conversation in the United States in this past, you know, 25 years. And I know that, you know, from my own experience of, you know, going up to Capitol Hill and, you know, in other settings where people can't ask, you know, stop asking questions about the Soviet Union. Actually, I can see Kelly and a couple of other people um, who were with me once on a foray up uh, to um, uh, testify in front of um, some congressmen who shall remain nameless. And one of them asked me, so, Miss Hill, what's going on with the Soviets these days? And I said, well, <laughs> this was in 2007. Uh, well, the Soviets haven't been around for a while. Uh, anyway, and then they also asked me what was going on in Kakikistan, which took me a while after listen to people laughing behind me uh, to uh, try to figure out which one they meant. And I uh, basically solved that by saying, well, across Central Asia, Congressman, things are uh, tricky. And afterwards, panicked and hoped that you know, kind of, uh, I hadn't, uh, you know, kind of missed uh, <laughs> some di divining some larger uh, intent there. But I think yes, absolutely. There's been a lot of sort of, uh, of, of, of blame on all kinds of sides for people not brushing up, you know, their their opinions and their viewpoints. And there is a lot of shaping of that, particularly in on Capitol Hill. And uh, look, because we know for a fact that. Uh, outside of the Senate, it's not, there's not a lot of incentives for members of the U.S. Congress to be really all that much up on foreign affairs unless they want to be on the Foreign Affairs Committee. The cycles of elections here of every two years, people have to be much more tied to the views of their constituency. Unless their constituencies have, you know, I don't know, in commodities, and, you know, the grain with uh, Russia or their farmers are selling, you know, chicken wings, I mean, you know, you know, kind of this, you know, to uh, to Russia, which of course they're probably not right now. Then there's not a great deal of incentive to really be sort of thinking about a lot of these, uh, a lot about these these issues. That doesn't mean to say that you know people are are woefully ill-informed or misinformed. It's just that there's an awful lot of um, incentives to think about other things. Just like in Russia, it's not the perpetual fixation on foreign policy. The polling. Uh, that um, Sergei Alexashenko and I have been in a lot of uh, meetings recently, actually all of you have probably been in similar ones, where he's showing kind of the polling uh, about Russian opinion for, uh, you know, over the last 20 odd years. And for the most part, until recently, the fixation has really been on economic issues and kind of nuts and bolts of domestic policy. That also means that uh, people are less likely to really understand, beyond Russia, the dynamics of other countries that have uh, emerged from the Soviet Union, like Georgia and Ukraine. And there was a great deal of misreading on all kinds of levels about the dynamic inside of Georgia. And we've obviously, you know, have done pretty poorly on uh, reading developments in Ukraine for the last 25 years. And I think it's highly likely that Mr. Poroshenko is going to find himself as unpopular as all of the previous leaders before. The problem is that the more emotional the relationship between the US and Russia gets over these kinds of issues, the more difficult it is for the United States in particular to do all the things that Russians and others think is a double standard, which is to kind of criticize uh, the interlocutor. Many of you remember during the war, um, or the run-up to the war with Georgia in 2008, there was a lot of criticism behind the scenes about what was going on in Georgia. But the fact that the Russians had Saakashvili in their crosshairs and kept talking about, you know, the kind of the, the fact that uh, Mikhail Saakashvili was a criminal and ought to be kind of ousted, raised the threshold for the public criticism by the United States. So the United States made a lot of criticism behind the scenes, where Russians and others couldn't hear unless they were, you know, listening in, and a lot less in public, and did a lot more talking about standing beside our friends, as Condoleezza Rice said publicly, or, you know, kind of with the, the Bush's trip to, to Tbilisi, and made a lot of rhetoric even though the criticism was behind the scenes. And there's been plenty of criticism about Ukraine and uh, the corruption and all of the problems inside Ukraine, I think actually quite publicly, it's still being uh, made. 
But while um, uh, Kiev and the current government are in the crosshairs of, uh, of, of Russia, it, it makes it much more difficult to do that publicly. It's just the, you know, the reality of, uh, of, of politics here. So I think, there's a, again, there's misreadings on, uh, on all sides there. There's a misreading about what happened in the case of uh, Ukraine in uh, Russia. And the problem is there were so many cooks in that broth that it's extraordinarily difficult to figure out quite what did happen around the ouster of, uh, of Yanukovych. And we've got all kinds of competing narratives. I, I certainly tried to interview as many people as I could around that. And you get a different story from pretty much everybody. Built in Sikorsky, think one thing happened. You know, Russia, obviously, uh, many Russians have uh, different views of what happened. The United States think another set of things happened. And it, just like in many of the events of uh, international history, we may never really kind of get down to quite what happened in, uh, in what sequencing. Let's just say it was a mess on rather a colossal scale and has led to um, a lot of real problems uh, for uh, people in Ukraine, just as the mess leading up to the war in Georgia, of similar miscalculation and misinterpretations have the same example. And even on your question on federalism, um, you know, the, the reasons that we've uh, stuck to the administrative borders go back to uh, the international legal precedent, um, not of uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union or Yugoslavia or anything, but back to the collapse of the Spanish Empire. This is one of the big debates um, in Europe, um, you know, back in the, um, the late 80s and 1990s when uh, Yugoslavia and other countries uh, fell apart, that of course the disposition of uh, modern states after the end of empires was based on this decision of the collapse of the Spanish Empire, because there was lots of wars after that to uh, change uh, those borders, that um, you know, whoever had it should keep it, even if those were artificial borders. There's not a single country in the world that is in any kind of natural borders. And coming from the United Kingdom, God knows what the United Kingdom is going to look like uh, in a, a few uh, years uh, from now. But the main point uh, was supposed to be that borders shouldn't be changed by force. Now we have Yugoslavia, and of course the cost of the decision was one that is very much um, uh, hotly disputed as kind of leading into that kind of question that you asked in the case of, uh, of, uh, of Russia. Why keep borders that were you know, designed you know, at a particular point, and then you know, why change them? In the case of Kosovo, I don't personally think it was actually the United States or the West finest hour. Uh, Kosovo, the independence was decided because there was a risk of violence um, breaking out again, and people didn't really want to have to kind of deal with this all over again. And the, the idea was that we could try to contain the decision on Kosovo, and it wouldn't be a precedent. And Russia immediately said, yes, it is going to be a precedent, and it became the precedent for Abkhazia and South Ossetia. But again, the Europeans had pretty much stuck to this. I mean, that's why, you know, Britain had been in negotiations behind the scenes before the Falkland Wars, ironically, with the Argentinians about a different power sharing um, over the, uh, the Falklands and Malvinas. Not a lot of people in Britain were that keen, practically, on you know, keeping a bunch of islands. And the joke was, of course, that they thought that the Argentinians had invaded Scotland because of Falkland uh, sound in uh, Scotland when this happened. And people were like, how did we not see them coming, you know, when the Falkland War broke out? But that was that was the act of force that, that triggered off uh, the response. And so that is really that uh, principle. Yes, the United States doesn't always hold to it, it hasn't, but the Europeans certainly have held to that. And I think that's where we've got into that issue about federalization. And that's why it's proving so difficult to find the solution that Russia wants in Ukraine about federalization, because nobody wants to see federalization at gunpoint, even if decentralization in some way uh, seems to be uh, necessary in uh, the case of, uh, of Ukraine. And on the issues of uh, state sovereignty, you're absolutely right that that has to be reconciled. Um, the United States doesn't always seem to uh, pay attention to state sovereignty, but in the European view, uh, every state has the right to choose. That's the whole purpose of the European Union, that small states have the same rights as large states. And um, what Russia is basically saying, well, of course, that's not true, because in practice, the big powers, the United States, China, Russia, and, you know, Turks, you know, kind of and others, you know, get the right to violate the rules when it, uh, when it suits them. But that's not what the Europeans are saying. And again, that's one of those fundamental differences. And if there is going to be some kind of uh, different approach to talking about European security, that's going to have to be at the root of it. Because that's one of the big differences between Europe and the United States. The United States and Russia are much closer in their kind of feelings that, well, when things necessitate it, there ought to be an intervention, particularly a military intervention, and the Europeans are not on that front at all. So that's why I keep getting back to the fact that it's not all about the US and Russia, even though it kind of might seem it. And basically deciding issues across the head of Ukraine is not going to go down well in, uh, in, well in Europe either. Richard, on the uh, US... Um... Right. I, mean, I think as, as Steve has, has made clear in some of his other writings, we've got a problem. It's a 
the uh, Putin administration just doesn't consider the Obama administration to be that strong uh, a foreign policy opponent. Um, and uh, I think you know, some of the, the, the evidence we have for this is, is, is well known, the, the troop cut back to Europe, the withdrawal from uh, and, and the decreasing interest in Central Asia, the, the failure to implement the stick to red line in the case of Syria or uh, North Korea and, and, and perhaps even Iran. Um, and I think this is due to multiple causes. And if you break out from them, whatever particular cause might have been doing, uh, driving that thing. One is, uh, in contradiction what was raised earlier, I don't think this administration is driven by a Cold War paradigm. At least when I came into office, and if you want to know this is better, to deal with the principles. There was a sense that the Bush administration had, you know, sort of in, 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 improperly or through whatever means had ruined relations with Russia. Uh, or at least make them a lot worse than they should have been, and that their mission was to reset this, to bring it back to a more normal level, where uh, if you just, you know, if you treat Russia better and so on, then you would address these problems. And, and perhaps this contributed to the Russian feeling this was going to be an easy, you know, weak administration to deal with. Um, there's also, as we said, it's Russia has stopped, has stopped being a priority for the administration. They really are more interested in, in or at least more driven on the day-to-day -day level by what's happening in Asia and the Middle East and so on. Um, so that means I'm very reactive in the case of what's going on in, in Russia. Uh, the money constraints, the other constraints, and the administration has not been able to, and Congress, of course, is mainly to blame for this. We have been able to be able to rectify the, the, the problems we're facing through sequestration and so on by basically getting our, budget, getting our budget system in order, and therefore they've had to make a lot of cuts and kind of programs which maybe would have either military or other would have given them more tools or look 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 convinced a, a greater attention in Russia and Moscow. And then lastly, I I, I promise to, to I want to raise it to make, see what kind of goes. My what you talked about, I'm not there's just a it's it's certainly one one element of European thinking. But you also get the strong element which was clear, for example, in the Munich Security Conference or elsewhere, that you don't want to you know, arm the Ukrainians or take other actions of getting to a fight with Russia uh, uh, needlessly. We have to basically manage our differences. Um, I mean, there's certainly a lot of drivers against trying to keep, you know, against periodic U.S. interests in moving Ukraine or Georgia closer to NATO or having putting troops in the Baltics or stuff like that. So I'm, I, this appears, at least the, the U.S. officials say, that this is a constraint, that they don't want to one of the Obama administration is very highly prized the solidarity they've been able to get from the European governments in the case of Russia, Iran, and elsewhere, and they don't want to jeopardize this by trying, for example, to force through a decision to arm the Ukrainians if it's going to ruin their relations with the European governments. Yeah, I mean, but that doesn't mean that you know the kind of Europe doesn't think very strongly about this. <clears throat> this is again the legacy of a difference of um, <clears throat> views from the war, from World War II. I just kind of uh, commend to all of you to look on YouTube for some pictures of Berlin on, you know, essentially the day after the war that were filmed by um, uh, an American uh, soldier in the occupying force. There's on YouTube. Have you seen them? I mean, they're, they're just astounding. And so I was in, I was in Berlin just a couple of weeks ago, and I went to the ex uh, exhibition, which is in the Topology of Terror um, Museum, you know, which is kind of basically the old Gestapo um, headquarters, the SS uh, headquarters of the last days of the war in Berlin. It's pretty devastating. And that there, was, there was no kind of sugarcoating you know, over all of this. Um, Europe was devastated by World War II, and just the way that you know, Russia was devastated over World War II. Now, Russia's casualty levels were phenomenal. And Putin has made an awful lot about this, as saying you know, no family was untouched. Well, I think the same can be said across large swathes of Europe. And the whole purpose of the very long period um, not just because of the Cold War, but from the 1950s onwards, the French and uh, German reconciliation, to so not go back to this, is a very important frame for Europeans, including in the United Kingdom and, and elsewhere. I mean, this is kind of, look, the United States tends to think, I've been living here for a very long time, and, but the very first time I got here, I was quite shocked by how different the narratives were about World War II here. America never talks about the Eastern Front, the Atlantic convoys, the Blitz, the Battle of Britain, what would you talk about? Anyway, it's all about the Normandy beaches and saving Private Ryan and a you know, quick burst across those bloody and awful burst across the sands to save the day. That's not what the war is like for the rest of uh, for Europe. 
I mean, I'm a product of decades of efforts of reconciliation. And that's kind of what Europeans were thinking that they were doing with Russia, with the, with the fall of the wall. That this was another process of reconciliation. They now think they didn't do it right. There's an awful lot of kind of second guessing on the part of a lot um, of Europeans, French and Germans in particular, that, that, which is why I think you see the Normandy format, about that the, perhaps they should have uh, taken the leaf out of the Elysee agreements. Those are the agreements that go back to French and German, France and Germany deciding to bury the very big hatchet. Remember, the French and Germans have been going at it as much as the Brits and the French and the Germans you know, for several uh, centuries. Uh, uh, my former colleague uh, from Brookings, um, Justin Weiss, who's now the head of policy planning in um, uh, France, his family were from Alsace-Lorraine. Several generations of his family got, you know, kind of totally and utterly marauded across by the Germans going west. His family uh, farm was devastated uh, three or four times and led to ruin. You know, he, he kind of jokingly talked about, you know, the various women in his family going, oh, here they come again, you know, the bloody Germans. Know, kind of marauding off to the west again. You know, this was a, this was a big um, uh, factor for the French. It was a huge step forward to kind of basically base that reconciliation. And then I was thinking that maybe that's what they should have done with Russia. That perhaps it was a mistake on you know the kind of to assume that Russia would just automatically come into the institutions when the French and the Germans deliberately crafted from the very beginning different institutions that became the basis of the EU. And they thought that you know through business and visas and other economic ties that Russia might embrace these two, not realizing that the narrative was so different, that Russia was in a different place in 1989. It wasn't in standing in the rubble of World <coughs> War II and kind of looking around. And that the narrative about victory in Europe was very different um, in Russia as we saw um, with May 9th. So this becomes kind of a basically a bit of a problem. That's the constraint, which gets back to the point about can we find you know, some other basis, some other way of kind of looking forward uh, from this and to, from reconciling it and for you know, kind of basically thinking about it. I think in a way, we're now talking about how do we reconcile with Russia. I mean, it, it, it's a sort of a kind of a reconciliation interrupted. You know, we thought we were doing something and we're really not. And that's kind of what the debate is within, uh, within uh, Europe. But it shouldn't, it's a constraint then on issues like arming Ukraine because the question is for what? More rubble? More people killed? More Ukrainians killed? More Russians killed? Where will that get us? The Europeans also don't buy that the higher the costs go, the, the easier it will be to change this mood of bravado. They just think that there'll be more people killed and you know, kind of the risk of escalation is high. So that's kind of what the questions that people are asking there. That is a constraint, but they want to know then, you know, where do we go from here? And nobody right now has the answer. Fiona, when you talk about World War II, let me ask you a little question. Sometimes I feel like when Putin started to redefine Molotov and Withdrawal Pact, and he does it very openly and sharply, uh, I think what he is basically saying, it's purely my reading, maybe it's not a bad thing for two or three big countries to make a deal about some small countries. Maybe we can benefit from that. We did benefit it when we agreed to unify Germany, United States, and the Soviet Union discussed it without Germans. Uh, maybe we should talk, and that's what some Russian politicians are saying, Maybe we should talk about some kind of Obama-Putin pact, exchange of Syria on Ukraine, or whatever you guys need. Russia can help you with. Uh, we did it. Uh, and that's a quite a, one of, I, if you don't know, one of mainstream uh, explanations why Kerry came to Russia. There is an offer uh, on the table to exchange one thing to another, and we have to build a historic precedent for that, and maybe Putin build up this. Uh, that's my question. But let's, uh, yeah, go ahead. Let's add to this question. A couple more. Yeah, I'll leave Vic to ask it out of my question. But I guess this question is for Fiona, and I think it's very interesting, this mention of um, the different legacies of Europeans and Americans in terms of uh, World War II. Like Justin, I, I have French, and my, the French side of my family is also from Alsace. And not, not a pre pretty place to be from. <laughs> my mother was in the exod, in the exodus, and my father fought in the uh, Canadian Army in World War II. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up as a child with World War II as, as a daily legacy. It was talked about daily at the dinner table all that. So I'm just I'm wondering, in terms of the current challenges that the West faces, whether, how can one imagine a positive policy rec reconciliation uh, blending, if you will, 
um, between the U.S. experience and the European experience in terms of finding some sort of positive common ground regarding current policy. Okay. <coughs> Wonderful presentations. Um, and I agree with, with, with so much of what's been said, but I do have to take some exception you know, to what you said about the historic memory. Uh, European views uh, in the lead up to World War II were informed by the experience of many of the statesmen uh, in their, from their own, their own service in, in the trenches in World right, War II. One, yeah, yeah. They didn't want to repeat that experience. Uh -huh. um, and I think that may be what we see going on today. People don't want to repeat the experiences of World War II, but they forget the other part of it. Mm -hmm. In the 1930s, that mm -hmm. desire to avoid the confrontation right. fueled the territorial aspirations of the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. but not, uh, are we not doing that now? Mm -hmm. I see another parallel. Uh, at the end of World War II, we sat down uh, as the great powers and we divided up Europe. We decided that, unlike the Versailles Treaty, we weren't going to take into consideration these small countries, their, their petty sovereignties. We would, amongst us, the great powers, decide where these people would go and what they would do. Um, so we've had that precedent. Uh, that isn't something you're, you're advocating today, I presume. No. Um, and I, does, does a European memory today incorporate, uh, particularly in Germany, uh, what, uh, what led the, 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 the Hitlerian discourse about protecting German ethnics uh, wherever they might be, and if their rights were, were uh, threatened, about um, addressing uh, the um, historic inequities of the settlements of the victorious powers of the, of, the, of the First World War, of the knife in the back from previous leaders, uh, in his case, alluding to Khrushchev and Gorbachev and implicitly Yeltsin. Um, how much memory is there in Germany of, of, of that? And when they want to redress the historic uh, uh, inequity toward Russia, do they think about Ukraine? Do they think that the invading German armies went through Ukraine, Belarus for that matter, on their way to Russia and did untold damage there? Back. Okay, let's take one more question. Right? And then one and we'll see how much time left. Mm -hmm. well, I'm Sweden and I'm the same fellow at CTR and I'm from Finland as well. Uh, my question is about Molotov Ribbentrop Treaty. Is that Putin's goal? Don't look at me. I asked. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that that's Putin's goal to achieve this kind of pact again? And if so, where would the line go? Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the question of uh, spheres of influence deal, um, that is certainly something I think the Russians are compatible. I, don't, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if there's the rumors that there's, there's trying to raise a deal. That's why Lavrov, that's why Lavrov went to meet with the head of NATO. That's why Kerry went there to talk about some kind of deal, Ukraine for Syria or something. Um, I think the Russians, in theory, might accept something like that, and they might even be considering that as an option. Um, the Chinese sometimes raise this idea, you know, you leave us alone in, in, in our part of the Pacific and we'll let you keep your part of the Pacific, you know, that's a great deal. Um, but it would never, the U.S. would never accept something like that. One, because of what we discussed earlier, that the, you know, we, it's just against American political philosophy and the view of what's legitimate to make decisions over the heads of these other governments. So whereas, you know, uh, we get uh, Stalin and Churchill say, well, you take 75% of this of this country, I want 90% of Greece, you can have, I mean, you, you, you bomb and, can't, and maybe would do some kind of a missile defense or something, but certainly wouldn't do that over some kind of general sphere of incident deal. And then two, they, I don't think it's important, that you could do it. I just don't think Russia and the United States have that kind of power anymore that they might have had during the Cold War. Uh, we see this now in Syria. They try and broker deals, and the local actors just ignore them. We've seen there was all this thinking that Russia could deliver Iran or China could deliver uh, North Korea if we, you know, as long as we make a deal with them. In turn, the U.S. might cut back on missile defense or do something else. Um, Tehran and Pyongyang have, have not followed the script. They pretty much, if necessary, the, the, the Iranians just ignored the Russians, rejected their proposals. And uh, the North Koreans are no one's, the Chinese have found the same problem. So I think 
it may be something that Russians are considering this kind of a deal. The U.S. would never accept it, and uh, I imagine some of the other Western European countries would have been rejected as well. And if we agree to it, it never work. Um, uh, let me say, I, Ed, I think maybe you might have misunderstood <clears throat> what I was saying. I'm not, I'm not entirely, because I think I was saying exactly what you were saying, but then maybe we were kind of, you know, the classic misperceptions of talking past each other. Because um, the, the, it's interesting in the case of Germany that um, the memories of World War One in Germany don't really resonate because the trauma of World War Two was so great in terms of particularly coming to terms with what had happened during World War Two and Germany's role in this that nobody really ever talks about World War One, and this is kind of um, very evident because in, in Britain, of course, World War One is a really big deal, and after the you know the hundredth anniversary outbreak of World War One, there've been a lot of attempts in the United Kingdom to actually have bilateral reminiscence and other kind of historical projects with Germany to get together Germans and French and Belgians, you know, to sort of talk about the slaughter in the fields of Flanders. And the Germans, it's just not part of the discourse. Because it's the, 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 the discourse in Germany is very much focused on World War II. And in that respect, it's not just that there's sort of a guilt about the invasion of the Soviet Union, there's an enormous guilt about Ukraine, which is exactly why there will be no acceptance of what's happened in Crimea and Ukraine. And if you talk to the German leadership, I mean, and that's the point I was trying to make about the Königsberg, the Germans aren't raising the return of any territory. There's a, there's a, there's a certain sense, in spite of you know, some of the younger generations kind of coming back with a little bit of revisionism, these stories about you know, kind of, 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 of books being published and people you know, kind of not having the same acute memories of the kind of legacy of World War II and you know, hearing about it from uh, their families, Nonetheless, there's a real feeling of incredible responsibility for the devastation of Europe in World War II. And that was the point that I was trying to get across, that when Europeans are thinking about reconciliation with Russia, they're more thinking about that they should have started from scratch in 1989, the fall of the wall, with thinking about Russia and being in the same position as the German uh, relationship was at that point, and trying to think of new ways to kind of move, uh, move ahead. The constraint in wanting to arm Ukraine is more about how will that lead to broader conflict? Not about, you know, will this kind of uh, result in solidifying uh, the territorial aggression? But there's very much also kind of a concern about, you know, because so many people have studied about what happened with Adolf Hitler and Neville Chamberlain and everything else, about being very careful, um, in spite of all the rhetoric, not to see the past as just repeating itself. When you listen to Angela Merkel and what she said at the Munich Security Conference, she was really tough on Russia and about what had happened in Crimea and Ukraine. What the difference was that she didn't want to rush into military action. She talked about strategic patience, which is what got Senator McCain and everybody else angry because she started talking about the long-term view, you know, about the collapse of uh, East Germany and the end of the Cold War. And you know, they, they weren't prepared for that, that, that view. They wanted to kind of have more action. But the constraint is on running into action, or rushing into action, because of the risks of a much broader war. The, the feeling in, in Europe that we could get into a war or to these scenarios is much higher than it is in the United States, and that, particularly because of the demands in the Baltic states and elsewhere for stepping up uh, the military action. So there's a real kind of feeling here about that a devastating war is not something that they want to see, but there's also an enormous feeling that we can't let this happen again, and that we're not going to let Russia's aggression go unpunished. But they're more limited then about what are we going to do about it. And this is why, although um, the sanctions have not been very effective, everybody's accepting that they um, have not had the desired results, there's also something of a reluctance to remove them in the absence of having something else. And again, why there's not going to be necessarily business um, as usual. Now, the further you get away from the old Eastern Front and from the memories of World War II, uh, when you get to sort of Spain and elsewhere, the less you're going to hear about that. I mean, if you talk to Spanish officials, like, well, why are we getting so wrapped up about Ukraine? Look what's happening in Libya. You know, look what's happening in the Mediterranean with this migrant crisis. And certainly in the southern Italy, that's also a fixation too. And the Greeks are less excised over this, you know, for a variety of reasons that I think we all are, you know, familiar with. But there is a huge debate about uh, Crimea and Ukraine and what to do about it in European circles. And it's shaped by World War II, and, and, and again, a lot of it by the guilt, particularly in Germany, of having marauded across uh, most of Europe and have set in motion a lot of the things that we're, uh, we're sort of seeing today. And particularly why there is an awful lot of um, anger at this narrative about Molotov-Ribbentrop. 
because the Germans don't want to see, um, and neither do the Brits, uh, frankly, a return to Potsdam and Yalta and carving this up. This is not where the European countries are. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, you know this from the point of view of Finland, you're part of the European Union, even if not in NATO, that the whole premise of the European Union was to avoid this again, to stop having small countries being, uh, being carved up. And, uh, you know, if Putin is trying to use this as saying, look, this was kind of a non-aggression pact, and this was really just sort of a maybe a misguided attempt at the big powers trying to resolve something, and his reference to unification of uh, Germany, that we kind of resolved us, and we were favorable to the Germans, and we did them a favor, that's not how it's playing out in Europe. In fact, the more that this is talked about, the less Europeans want to, or the Northern Europeans in particular, want to consider, you know, kind of a, a, that kind of direct dealing. Uh, with Russia, they want to make sure that Ukraine is in the uh, uh, is, is very much uh, part of this. So while the Germans are talking about the framework for the OSCE, in fact, to the principles that the OSCE enshrines with their presidency that's coming up in 2016, precisely because there's a suspicion that if there was such a pact or there was a kind of a return to a new Yalta, that the borders would be well and truly in the Baltic states, might well be into Finland, they might be into any place that wants to be part of the Russian Empire, or into Poland, you know, and elsewhere. Uh, in terms of a demand for, you know, a veto over what happens, even if it isn't in terms of the acquisition of territory. So we're very much in different places, and that actually gets back to, you know, this larger question here. Um, how do we find a way um, about looking at this legacy of World War II to have a policy of reconciliation that lead into this? In the European context, we start with steel and coal. Um, I think at one point there might even be a, dis a discussion in the European context to start with oil and gas. You know, as a kind of a win. I mean, I do know, you know, you know how some of that is founded in, um, uh, you know, in different ways because, again, of the difficulties of relationship. But the Europeans, when they started their modernization partnership with Russia, were thinking that that was the antidote, that that was the kind of the way of moving forward, that you would have this strategic partnership for modernization with Russia. You would lead to uh, visa liberalization. It'd lead to a whole bust of um, projects, and then that would be the beginnings of a kind of a reconciliation project that would integrate uh, Russia into those institutions. If it wasn't going to be NATO, then maybe the EU. Well, that all went horribly wrong um, with Ukraine. So I think we're kind of, in many respects, back to the starting uh, position again. We're trying to figure out how we do something just like this. So there's no easy answer to that question, but I think where we are. We're trying to figure out how to do it precisely. Any final thoughts or any become I mean, we run out of time to defer, uh, but there's a good opportunity to continue this conversation, particularly on historic narratives and understanding of uh, current uh, historic mindsets. Yeah, tomorrow, uh, the yeah, the paper that yeah. to talk about. tomorrow we have a, yeah, yeah. another presentation uh, of a, a Russian world. What does it mean and uh, how to treat it? Uh, by Marlene, she's here. I don't know. It will be distributed. The report will be distributed tomorrow. So that bunch of questions you asked, it definitely can be discussed tomorrow. So. The same time, same place, on the seventh floor. Seventh floor, sorry. Oh, seventh floor. <laughs> Next floor, so we're going up. Uh, same thing, I hope. So, you guys, uh, come over. We will be happy to see you. And uh, finishing, I would say one thing I noticed. You know, and I don't have an answer, and I talked to Fiona at least several times about that, and maybe you guys can help us to find out an answer. I noticed a long time ago that every Russian leader come to Kremlin. Gorbachev, Yeltsin, Putin, Medvedev, uh, Putin again, and even before Brezhnev and Khrushchev, they come with an idea to improve relations with the United States. That's what they do the first couple of years. They try hard, or not hard, but they try. In two or three years, they change their political agenda, and when they leave in coffee, they are usually extremely anti-American. All of them, sometimes in the middle of the road, became anti-American Russian politicians. What's happened in the middle? Why? Where is the, what, what is the wrong spot in our relations? We have to find out why even Medvedev was considered to be the most liberal guy now, probably even more anti-American than Putin. 
So that's a question for your good night things. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I'll see some of you tomorrow. Thank you.